You're watching LMCC. Hello everybody, my name is Bob Akhairi. I apologize about the delay. We had kind of a surprise. We, when we got here, we did a test, it worked, and then when it came to showtime, the HDMI cord just didn't want to work. So that's what it is. So we're now live downloading everything onto this laptop as we go. If we're missing a slide, no problem. I'll pivot, we'll keep moving. Now I'm really glad I labeled them all. Um, so again, this is, I would, they asked me to kind of give you all an introduction to, and yes, I am a lawyer, the undercover division, but the, uh, the idea to give you all an introduction to modernism and kind of create an appreciation of it, because as Todd said, and as Scott said, it's something that we don't necessarily think of. Um, I'll say the scary thing, 1972 is 50 years ago, so that would make something uh, by age qualify for the National Register of Historic Places, so that should kind of put things in perspective when we're starting to talk about historic buildings, we're talking about buildings that people don't expect. Larry Millett, who I, who I know socially a few times, put it best, it's like, I remember when this stuff was built. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but Annie wrote that exceptional book on uh, modernism in Minnesota. So with all that said, let's start cutting through this. And I had a lot of photos because I go through them quickly. We're not gonna be sitting and, 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 and focusing and, and soaking in each one, except until we get towards the end, because what I would like to do is first, explain what makes modernism important. So again, I'm Bob Ack, that's what I draw on the board every time I teach, makes people remember my name is Bob Ack, okay? So uh, not that, not that it, it's gonna make a huge difference. So yeah, I do the registry map, that's the Dokomomo registry map. Those aren't things we're trying to preserve, for, to be clear. Those are just in a, an opportunity to kind of document examples of modernism throughout the state, and I go through, I look through a lot of records, um, and, and I don't sleep, he's right. Uh, and, and, and try and find things and attribute them where possible. So, um, yeah, but let's move on. So what is modernism? And that's, I think, sometimes a, mis a misunderstanding. It doesn't mean a hideous box, which I think some people assume, some faceless apartment structure that they dislike in their neighborhood. I'm not talking about that. When you think about modernism, you have to kind of go back to, uh, and we're gonna take a brief look at modern architecture, starting with the end of the century. Um, and uh, the end of the 19th to 20th century. Because as we were heading there, we had technologies that were coming up. The idea of using reinforced concrete, the idea of using uh, iron and steel, as well as a desire to depart from traditional Beaux-Arts structures and, and other things, classical structures. So we're not really talking about this sudden leap into um, what people assume we're talking about when we're talking about modernism. We're talking about um, opportunities to sort of break away and be creative. So for example, we're gonna start with Art Nouveau, which is a weird thing to think about, but it is at the time a radical break from what was going on before. And when we look at Art Nouveau, we look at buildings like this, which now you look at and you think, gosh, that's such an old building. But at the time, this, uh, this structure in, in Brussels was considered quite daring, quite radical, and I'm glad it's showing up. Sorry, I'm just still paranoid about us when we kind of go through this. Again, just kind of moving through, you know, a, a structure like this in Paris, what made it interesting was the desire to use reinforced concrete. It was the first church built like that in France. And, you know, even though it has Art Nouveau design elements, architect absolutely hated extraneous ornamentation. He was just trying to use it in places he felt was natural rather than just slapping, um, slapping decorations on a building. And, you know, you get things that are even more austere, like the Willow Tea Room in Glasgow. Um, while on the inside, again, you know, the years on these things, these are, again, turn of the century um, as we move on. And then in Spain, I'm sure you all know Gaudi because that modernisme, that is, again, a radical departure from what was going on before. This was considered modernism. This was considered a new approach. Um, and, you know, and, and the idea of using geometric patterns and pa patterns from nature, especially when we're talking Art Nouveau, is what made it such a radical departure from what was going on before. Another example was the Vienna Secession. You have these kind of magnificent buildings like the Secession Building, um, where again, where they're using forms kind of calling back to sort of more classical designs or more monumental designs, but adding interesting ornamentation. Um, and, and doing things that would become modern. One thing you're gonna realize is sort of like an evolutionary tree, there are many different branches to all of this. 
there, there aren't necessarily one clean line when we're talking about what creates modernism. And obviously in the United States, we had our own version of it coming up with the prairie style. You can't not mention the Bank of Owatonna. I think that's still one of the most spectacular structures in the state. Um, as well as if you just go across the state line and see what a Minnesota firm designed in Sioux City, one of the most colossal uh, prairie style buildings I think there is. Um, and industrial design was going on in parallel. So we're talking about structures like this 1909 uh, turbine factory in Berlin. The idea of taking something and, and breaking it down to its core structure, but to benefit industry. Um, that's a, a good shot of the inside of that structure. Benefiting workers. This is, again, modernism. We're th talking about ways to do things. And in this state, just like a block down that way. I loved running into this article in a 1968 issue of the AIA Journal, because yes, I do read back issues. Um, there, <laughs> there we go. There's Trinity Episcopal Church, because it was a great example of concrete being used in the 1860s. So when we talk about that, the approach to that structure and the approach to the design and, and, and building up vertical stacks, pouring in the concrete, building up, building up, that was considered modern at the time. Um, again, it, by the way, it's so funny. I found out like the most, the oldest relevant building in the United States is actually, I think it's just over in Wisconsin from the 1840s. So again, it's, it's fascinating to see this stuff in this region. Um, again, other different parallel lines of modernism, the style, in uh, the Netherlands, obviously this is a classic structure that completely fits everyone's view of the style. Um, you know, just beautiful interior, very open. It was really radical. You can kind of see the uh, channels in the ceiling for where the sliders can kind of go in because the client, and clients I think are just as responsible for really exciting buildings, um, wanted to be able to have something that could be open as necessary and adjusted as necessary. Hey, I've seen that chair before. Um, and then another example, like not just that house, but the classic, again, the style, styling in a, in a housing development in Rotterdam. Expressionism, you know, and the classic example is the Einstein Tower in Germany. Um, I want you to remember Eric Mendelssohn because he's gonna come in this, when we get to talking about Minnesota, um, one of his final works is here in Minnesota. But this is a classic idea of using um, materials and, and expressions of, of, of form that weren't being done before. Um, again, the classic church in Reykjavik is another great example of that. Um, and then you get Art Deco, which is I think what a lot of people think is at that borderline, um, where we start seeing more geometric shapes rather than necessarily using the natural shapes you saw in Art Nouveau. Um, so here you have the Hoover Building, yeah, the US Vacuum Company in uh, their office in London. Um, Cincinnati Union Terminal, there's a great comparison with Cincinnati Union Terminal and the Art Nouveau um, train station in Helsinki that was designed by Ilyil Saarinen, who of course came here and designed Christchurch Lutheran um, before he, he kind of uh, went deeper into that. I had to include this building. I used to live near it. Uh, <laughs> Eastern Columbia building in LA, uh, classic Art Deco. You can't not mention Fauché. I love using ads because it's fun to see how relevant the buildings in the state of Minnesota were in national journals. This is from a national magazine, and I thought this was a great example of, of seeing that. So I guess if you're looking for specifications on steel forms, you know who to go for. Um, and uh, <laughs> Rand Tower, another classic. And this is an exciting building. I think it reopened during the pandemic, which I think has let, not let people see it quite as much. But it is absolutely glorious. Get a chance to go back and see this thing. Um, the interior is, is just magnificent. And it is a great example of Art Deco and Modern. Um, and of course, Tonka Theater just down the street. You can't not mention it. Um, Liebenberg and Kaplan were a very avid uh, theater designers across the state of Minnesota and the region. Um, this is, I believe, is the first one, not the one, <laughs> because they had to obviously replace it pretty soon after they built it. And then, you know, you get these extensions of it with Modern, Streamline Modern. This is a great example of that in San Francisco. You get, uh, the, you know, the Pan Pacific Auditorium in L.A. That's what's left of it, the rest of it burned down. And I mean, you could even reference Laramie Ford just down the street, AKA the Tonka building. Um, I couldn't find the architect on it. But again, I, when I first I saw that, I'm like, oh, sweet, very nice, sweeping, curving lines, perfect for automobiles. I mean, that's what you think of. You think of motion, you think of activity. Um, and then you get a great example like uh, St. Paul City Hall. This is actually, again, from a national publication, um, Holliburton Root with LRB. Uh, they did this kind of you know, zigzag modern. If you've never been in the building, you absolutely have to go inside of it. I mean, I, I think anyone who's been in it can tell you exactly 
Oh, do I not have the next image? <laughs> Sorry, did I finally hit the root? Did I hit the, wait, let me see here. Sorry. The, uh, doo -doo, doo -doo. well, that's funny. I know that's not the end of it. Let me see where we are here. I, I wonder if it hits something that didn't get transferred and then it just decided to say like, you know what, I'm gonna nope out. There we go. So again, the inside of it, um, and that just incredible hallway. I mean, I couldn't get, unfortunately the lighting in this photo is terrible, so I do apologize. And then, you know, the, uh, what is now I think Lumen, I mean, you know, that company was CenturyLink, and then before that it was a tribe called Quest, and then, you know, now it's, at this point it was the Northwest, Northwestern Bell Telephone Company building. That's, by the way, why they removed that, that kind of crown it had on top. It wasn't original. That was added much later. So you can see this original sketch doesn't, doesn't have it on top. But I'm sure some of you know that one. Um, again, as we're moving on, PWA Modern. It's kind of named after, again, the Public Works Administration, lots of government-funded buildings. There's actually very few examples quite as, as, as solid as the Minneapolis Armory. It is an enormous building. When it was built, it got a lot of national coverage because of how, how large it was at a time when the Great Depression. And then you could even talk about the Deep Haven School Auditorium just down the street is kind of an example of, of modern. Or um, even I was driving by and I saw that Excelsior Public Works building. It's later 1950-ish from what I could tell from the satellite photos. I didn't have a clear date on it, but it wasn't in a photo in the 40s, but it wasn't a photo in the mid-50s, so that's roughly where I would put it. 1937! 1937! We have a winner! Um, <laughs> thank you! <laughs> so, uh, again, I, but it's, a, it's, a, it's nothing spectacular, but you can definitely see the use of glass block, and it's, usually these buildings aren't this well maintained. I'm gonna be honest, when you see these around the state. So that's why I was stunned when I saw it. And then you have to talk about, you know, the Bauhaus. Now we're seeing more modernism, the, the Bauhaus building in Dessau, Germany, Walter Gropius, it's a name we're gonna come back to in a bit. Um, again, the idea of building a structure, he was heavily influenced, by the way, by US industrial buildings, US um, grain elevators, and again, that's what we're gonna come back to. But we see that kind of modernism in this structure and his idea to help workers, because that's why you see all this glass. Um, his earlier factories were also like that. He was heavily influenced by that AEG turbine factory we saw a little bit earlier. Um, and in the Soviet Union, we have constructivism. Here we have a great, cool house, an architect's house, of course. Uh, <laughs> Melnikov house in Moscow. Um, that's what the front of it looks like. And then we have, you know, again, the workers' club because we're Soviet Union. Um, and this is a spectacular example of Soviet constructivism, which I, I hope it survives, but it is in Kharkiv. So this is in the middle of it right now um, to date this particular lecture. Um, and then, you know, you have this fascinating garage that, again, in, the, uh, in, in Moscow. And then you also saw the rise of international style. This is going to be what a lot of people think of when they think of modernism. So when we're talking about the international style, it was named at, you know, one of the most seminal, you know, uh, art exhibitions at um, the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Henry Russell Hitchcock and the architect Philip Johnson, we'll talk about him because, I mean, he designed IBS Center. In 1930s, sat down, they pulled all the work they really liked in Europe and put it on display. And this particular um, exhibition, which traveled a bit, was highly influential and also named it the, uh, the international style. Um, so it, this is a, a pivotal moment as we kind of evolved. The catalog is, is a highly sought after item and it created a textbook. Um, and we're gonna get to more of these buildings in a bit. So then we get World War II, everything gets shaken up. We all know that it, it all of society was affected. Heading into this, it seemed like Modern and Art Deco were the dominant styles. And then we come out of it, and it, we start to see different, re, different changes. And why? They had to rebuild Europe. When you got back, uh, especially with all the GIs coming home, you had, of course, material shortages and the baby boom. That combination equals a housing crunch. So there are all kinds of ideas of trying to make housing in a hurry. Prefab housing, simple materials, new materials, trying to use them in an efficient manner. Um, I, I took some examples uh, from the survey that was done by the, the local assessor in 1956. This house, nothing special. I'm not saying let's preserve it. And first of all, it's gone. But, but second of all, it, but it's an example of things that were being just like, we got to slap together a house in a hurry because people need housing. So when you see houses like this, they're almost always from that era of the late 40s and into the 50s. 
Um, and you, you see these, too. This is a foundation house. They built this in 1945. By 1956, someone's still living in it. There is a house on top of it now. But uh, at the time, you see these, these, um, these, because again, you could get the masonry. You couldn't get the wood to go on top of it. So sometimes it was kind of a, a, a difference of what you get on top. I mean, nowadays, they just scrape a house and build a new house on top of it. So I guess it isn't all that different. Um, this house struck me because it, you can tell it was just somebody wanted to get a house, and so they worked with masonry. I don't think it used an architect. It probably was just vernacular architecture, but it was interesting to see how the back of it, again, on a slope lot, taking advantage of a, a view of a lake, and those narrow windows that you kind of tend to see in older structures. It was just a fascinating one. As well as, you know, in Minneapolis, we have quite a few examples of this. The Lustron Company building these prefab metal houses. We did a tour in one with Docomomo a few years ago, and one of them went on the market, actually just down the street from this. Um, they're all over the country, well, mostly through the Midwest. But uh, again, a good example, all metal house. And they've surprisingly aged well um, all these years later. Or, you know, here's an 80s version of it. This is actually in Shorewood, close to the Greenwood. This is, you know, a roundhouse. Um, Orbit Homes uh, hired the local architect, Frank Patty, to design these kind of spoked houses. And you'll occasionally see them. They're really fun to spot in a satellite photo because you're like, is there a roundhouse in this? Or am I just, are my eyes playing with me? And then you, you find out they're there. Um, you know, or you see examples of trying to advertise the use of, of new materials. The Alcoa Carefree House in St. Louis Park. We did a tour of this one. But um, designed by a national architect for Alcoa, they built examples of this house all over America. And then, you know, they'd have people come and tour them. So this is, again, another good example of that. This, this house was lovely, lovingly restored, as you can see from those, those bright colors. Um, and then we get to the mid-century style. Hard to say it's one exact thing, but at this point, people are sampling from all of those styles we just talked about before the war. Um, you know, again, looking at examples in locally, because uh, I don't want to jump too far. The, again, that house is no longer, sorry, no longer extant. Um, another example, maybe not by an architect, but a classic just kind of clean style, a walkout basement. This building's still there, Anderson Interiors. Um, classic style, you know. The, uh, the Northern States Power Company, I'm pretty sure, I couldn't figure out who designed it, but I'm sure it was an in-house architect for the company. There were architects who would work for them because they had so many of these sort of smaller buildings. Um, this Brenner Studio, I'm surprised it's still there and I'm impressed it's still there. Uh, it's been altered a fair amount, but not terribly. Like they made that, that sign, that classic kind of uh, signpost a bit bigger. Yes, I was taken the other day. Uh, and then the Red Owl, uh, which, they restored it. It used to have that horrible white fake wood exterior. I don't know what was going on there. It was better known as Bacon Drug. Better known because supposedly Mick Jagger went in there and a local, um, a lo and you all probably know him. I apologize. I read the story of Jimmy. Was it Jimmy? Yeah. Who said, you know, you can't always get what you want. And then that, you know, there you go. <laughs> and so the legend grows. It's wonderful. I don't care if it's true or not. It's awesome. And again, the, but the, the actual design of that structure is from when it was a Red Owl. And I, I now, I think it's what, Red Sauce Rebellion? I think they should call it Red Owl Rebellion. That would have been a bad, that would have been an awesome name. Uh, <laughs> so brutalism, this is, this is a name that just honestly gets it just, people don't appreciate brutalism because of, okay, and then of course I use this building, one of the most controversial ones they've ever done. But the idea of brutalism isn't about making something like brutal, which I guess the way I'm dressed sort of fits. But the, uh, the idea is to use things, and it came from the Swedes, for the record. They, weren't, they didn't mean it in the same sense we were using it. And then it came to Britain, and the British kind of ran with it. But the idea was trying to use uh, materials true to themselves. So concrete looks like concrete. Brick, the first brutalist structure that was named, that was brick. The brick looked like brick. The I-beam was somewhat visible, and so it looked like an I-beam, metal. So you're not trying to make a material look like another material. So this, again, and, and trying to make it rationalist, making it purely functional. What is the building used for? Let's make the building aim at the inside out, for lack of a better term. So where are your rooms supposed to be? What do you need to do there? Let's design it. Let's make it logic, logical, and let's give it some level of organization. So this is the Yale Art and Architecture Building by Paul Rudolph. Now it's actually called Paul Rudolph Hall. Um, and he led that school for a number of years. Uh, the classic one, one of the most controversial ones ever made, was Boston City Hall. Uh, again, you can't not, that, that's a, the classic example. Or, you know, the Barbican Estate in London. This is actually an upscale, and it's remained upscale, uh, public, it's not public housing, but a housing designed by the government to kind of encourage more movement. 
Trellick Tower by <clears throat> Goldfinger. Wah, wah, wah. You know, true story. He was, they named the Bond character after him because he was a jerk. And he got mad and wanted to sue it. And then they said, well, I'll name him Gold Blank. And he's like, okay. <laughs> you know. But he was a Hungarian-born architect who lived in Britain. But this is a, this is a, a, a building that went from being um, absolutely loathed to being loved again. And it's scary. I hate to tell you this. Millennials dig this. They dig this style. Um, so uh, beware. <laughs> I'm a millennial at heart, or, or, and, and the Gen Z, Gen Z too, oh my goodness, I love teaching Gen Z. Habitat 67 in Montreal, another classic one, this one kind of gets into metabolism, but I didn't want to get too broad. Um, Giza Library in UC San Diego, classic. And then we get the Sea Ranch style. This is a rare one to talk about, but it's important because it influenced housing styles everywhere. Sea Ranch in California, it's in Northern California. These ideas of using things that kind of blended into the environment and this kind of, you start to see a lot of shed roofs being used all over the place after this particular structure. But the idea was it was supposed to here, go with the wind, go with the, the slope, use you know na local materials, kind of blend in with the vernacular sort of style. Um, you see shingles, you see wood on the interior, but there is, there's method to the madness. Look at that view, oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> And again, you see kind of this, this, lovely, this lovely approach. So that's why I brought up Sea Ranch, because it is relevant. Then we get late modernism, which is where we start to see buildings. These tend to be buildings that, that embody the entities for which they are from. They tend to be large entities, like, like a bank, or in this case, the Ford Foundation with that famous atrium, um, or government institutions. This is the Weyerhaeuser Corporate HQ. This is something Dokomomo has been working on in the background because they are trying to encroach on this building and ruin what is otherwise an extremely beautiful landscape that was designed with it. Because landscape architecture is just as important as what we think of structural architecture. Um, and then, you know, I, I love this building. This, this has a really funny story. They actually, Control Data actually had a building design like that Weyerhaeuser one I just showed you. And then they decided, oh, no, that isn't very Minnesotan. And they backed away from it. And it would have been built at the exact same time that Weyerhaeuser one was. It even won an award, which was awkward because no one told Control Data that their architects, HJ, had entered it into the, a national contest. So it won. And then I read the Star Tribune article or the Minnesota, Minneapolis Tribune, and they were like, Oh, that design was like two years ago, you know? And then they, they hired, I think they, this, these guys are based out of Omaha, HDR, and they designed, you know, a classic. At the time, this, this copper tone glass, you see it a lot because it was actually energy efficient, and energy efficiency was a big deal at the time. Uh, it still exists, it's, and then, you know, now glass can do a lot more and be any, just about any color, but it's still out there in Bloomington. Um, another classic late modernism, you got the uh, Pennzoil in Houston by uh, Johns. Johnson and Burgess, that, that's actually just the same, Virgie, the same people who did IDS Center. Um, and then the Citicorp Center in New York City, designed from 19, built in 1974 to 1976 with an asterisk, if you know the story about them realizing that actually the, uh, the math didn't work and they had to strengthen those legs. Um, before, that didn't fall. Postmodernism, historic. Yes, postmodernism is historic, um, as horrifying as this is. But I'm going to tell you, the original house we think of when we think of postmodernism, 1962 to 1964 is when it was built. That's an awfully long time ago for most of the people in this room. Um, so that is, this is a classic. And of course, the architect's home for his mother. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's an icon. And just same time he was building the Guild House in, again, in Philadelphia. Um, the one that probably the most controversial would be the Portland building by Michael Graves to the horror of Pietro Belusky. Um, we'll get to Pietro in a second. Big thinkers. So when we're talking about, again, the evolution of modernism, we're talking about people like Albert Luce, who lived in Austria, the concept of ornament and crime. His buildings tended to be very um, radical. So 1909, with how little ornamentation there were on the outside, um, there it is today. Yet on the inside, they tended to be somewhat traditional. You start to see a little bit there that isn't too um, unusual, but some of his houses were, were astonishingly stark. 1910, I'm going to take a moment. This is the show house in Vienna, 1913. This person's going to come up, this family's going to come up in a little bit because their daughter moved here. Um, again, but the step design was kind of neat, the idea of creating terraces. And the interior, again, a little more ornate than you'd expect, but, but at the same time functional. Um, and then you can't not mention Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, I think the Frank Lloyd Wright organization would come in 
put a hit on me if I didn't bring him up in, a, in any talk on architecture. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> what quote do you use? Well, I think that greatest architect of all time by the AIA kind of works there. But you, you really have to, this isn't one of his buildings, but he was working for Sel Louis, Louis Sullivan um, at the time when they designed the Wainwright building. Louis Sullivan came up with the famous, well, popularized form follows function. But he didn't mean it in the sense that some people think of it now where it needed to be plain, it needed to just be you know, the bare minimum. It meant that instead of following precedent, form should follow the function of the building. So precedent, there was no precedent for a skyscraper or a 10-story or a 12-story building. Instead, do what you need using technology to make it work. So that's when you get a building like this. Um, and then he went on, on his own. He started to design buildings that, that, that displayed the prairie style and buildings that were quite radical. This is the only building in this show that from the non-Deep Haven uh, Excelsior buildings that, that is no longer extant in Buffalo, the Larkin Administration building with that just amazing atrium in the center. Um, got demolished in 1950 for a building that never got built. I think it's still a parking lot. <laughs> so, but really, Unity Temple, again, in Chicagoland, is one of those important buildings that internationally made people realize there is an American style. So if you get a chance, I, I recommend visiting it. The interior is, is exceptional. Um, so much can be said upon it, I, uh, I recommend looking it up. Roby House in Chicago, again, this is now, I believe, the University of Chicago owns it. Um, it's been restored quite well. Um, and then we're talking Deep Haven. We got to talk about the Francis Little House, um, which was then built again, now, gosh, 100 and 110 years ago, um, leveled because it was no longer fashionable and, you know, a little bit difficult to upkeep. But, but of course, it's been cut up in several parts, so you can go and see it at the Met. Um, if you've ever been there to see the interior, or if you've been to MIA and seen the hallway, or if you find yourself in Allentown, uh, Pennsylvania, you can see the library. Um, eventually, they come together like a Frank Lloyd Voltron. Uh, <laughs> that might be a, I don't know how what age groups are going to get that one. Um, and then we're going to talk about Le Corbusier in France, a house is a machine to live in. You know, you start to see his, his radical ideas, that the idea of, of uh, five points with, you know, the uh, pistola is putting a, a building on these, these reinforced concrete, stru uh, concrete uh, pillars and, and elevating it off the ground to allow more room underneath. But the design allowed for this open planning, which was radical at the time. So the interior walls and the exterior walls weren't load bearing for the most part. You could do so many creative things. And on the roof, he wanted them to be functional. He wanted them to have roof gardens. And uh, Via Savoy is probably his most famous example of this. I always find it interesting, the reason the underside of it uh, is got that curve is he, a Citroën of that era when he was designing it, that was its turning radius. So a car could just go and easily slide under and park. Um, again, it's uh, radical at the time, and, and it's still beautiful now. I recommend going to see it. It's near Paris. Uh, again, the interior, as you can see, extremely open, extremely programmable, functional. Um, you can do what you want with it. The ramps that gradually take you up and let you see the progress of the house and a functional roof. And then he designed you know, public housing. He was really trying to figure out what to do with a post-war Europe, but even before post-war Europe. This in Marseille is a love or hate building. I know it, okay? But it is the radiant city. The, uh, and it absolutely has, it, it's funny, this building kind of has gone, um, it has its fan club, it certainly does. And you can see here the massive concrete pillars that it rests on opening up the underneath. We're talking about sort of these, the, the light with concrete and, and, and using it for interesting styles. And then the idea of these interior hallways that allowed people to circulate and, and shops, excuse me. And um, again, this structure, it's one, the more you learn about it, the more fascinating it is. And then here we have the waiting pool on the top and some of the, the items up there. Um, the ch very famous Notre Dame du Hot in Rochamp, um, probably mangling my French here, uh, but he, he loved to kind of place windows in ways that would let you sort of seem like there was no window frame. He just putting glass and concrete, creating this almost rustic look but to radical effect. Uh, this particular, um, uh, uh, um, oh my gosh, nunnery, I don't know, that's, that's a Shakespearean way of phrasing it. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, I turned off the mic. Uh oh, did the battery die? <laughs> yeah, no, no, don't worry. I, I'm used to speaking in a loud group. All I have to do is just raise my voice a little bit, and now I can feel a little more free. All right, so let's keep going. So this building, again, it, it, it's, it's, 
From the outside, people dislike it, but then when you start to see, the in, this is the courtyard inside, you see the creativity, you see all the window slats, and when you get inside the structure, the light is just used to such great effect. The raw concrete, again, that is an element of what we would consider brutalism, the idea of it is concrete, it's not trying to fool you into thinking it's anything but concrete. Um, but you can see how he used light and how he used space and negative space to create what is going on here. In this case, yeah, he did paint it. Uh, <laughs> but it, it just creates these delightful shapes and then the views and the windows all taking full advantage of its position. And then uh, uh, wrapping up, Le Corbusier, you know, he was redesigned, uh, Chand um, oh my gosh, Chandigra in, uh, in India. This particular structure, uh, it's, he redesigned almost the majority of the city. Uh, as India became independent, they had hired him to kind of create it. But you see that just these delightful ideas, delightful approach to creating a big open space for that particular government. Now, you can also not mention Ludwig van der Rohe. Uh, less is more, says what it is. God is in the details. His buildings were so very well planned, meticulously. Everything had a purpose. Um, and to an extent, one of the most important buildings he ever des designed was the Barcelona Pavilion, which was designed for an expo. It didn't last. They demolished it within a year. And then they, uh, they ended up rebuilding it many years later, uh, close to the spec it was on. Um, you see, again, little amount of material, but what they do is precisely measured. You see that kind of uh, um, X-shaped uh, pillar. You see the use of lavish wall materials to create this incredible effect, um, as well as, you know, the, the, the juxtaposition of, of, of water and, and stone and, and metal. Um, so this is an example of an early house he did in, in uh, Brno and now in the Czech Republic. Again, radical at the time. Again, helpful that it was by a very wealthy client so they could kind of have some fun with this. But you see, again, at the time it was, it was a house that shocked people going inside of it because of how open the plan was. This was something, again, we're talking the 1920s and the 1930s. This isn't something you typically see in Europe, um, let alone the United States. So you see these, these beautiful total designs, and the furniture was oftentimes designed with it. I should say those are Barcelona chairs. They were originally designed for that pavilion that we were just talking about. You can buy, see them in many a law office around the world, um, but in other places as well. Um, again, you see the, the use of materials for the walls, the use of, oh, are we good again? We see the, uh, <coughs> not to, <laughs> the use of exotic woods um, just to create a luxury feeling to it, but at the same time, the precision. And the Edith Farnsworth House in Illinois, another important structure, this all glass thing and, and the saga that went into building it, um, just beautiful, the way it floats above to kind of hopefully also counteract flooding. It didn't really, but, uh, and interestingly, they've now gotten to naming it, the, it used to just be referred to as the Farnsworth House, and in recent years, they've been said, no, it's Edith Farnsworth. She was the client. Let's not erase that part from history. It wasn't a Mr. Farnsworth. It was Edith Farnsworth. Um, and then the Seagram building, which it's so funny. You see this building, you're like, I've seen a building like this. Well, that's because they all were copying this. Uh, <laughs> at the same time, it was considered a moment where so many of those ideas were so succinctly used in one space. The idea of clean lines, the idea of, of everything serving a purpose, the idea of using a public space and trading sort of a public uh, space in front of the building for additional height, uh, which was also at the time, New York changed its laws because they thought this was such a good idea um, to require sort of a public area next to some of its, uh, its tallest structures. Um, and e even though it is purely a form follows function kind of building, there are a few little bits of decor in it. There are on the exterior, the, uh, the spandrels or the, the sort of the exterior sort of vertical lines aren't actually structural. They're just there to kind of look cool. Technically, that it's being held from what's behind it. But again, that, so there were a little flourish there. You can, have, you, can you, you set the rules to have exceptions to them, I suppose. Um, and then, uh, again, uh, museum in Germany in Berlin that he did. Uh, and then Walter Gropius. Here's the Vegas factory, 1911, radical at the time. You see that use of windows, ample windows. You can still visit it today. And then he moved, he was one of the, the emigrants to the United States. His house in Massachusetts is stunning uh, for its, its, it's important because again, his, his obsession was what made him special was especially his, his, his care about what a building is meant to do or how to make things work for less. His, his house uses a lot of industrial and commercial uh, uh, materials to do what it does. Um, 
from the slats to the fixtures, all these things, he saw them and he said, you know, I think this could work in a residential structure. Um, some of the furniture pieces are things you'd probably recognize from a design within reach or wherever you want to go. I mean, a lot of his, 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 his design and his taste, but it, it worked and it made something that, uh, that was different. I, I always liked, I, for the purpose of this, I wanted to mention the Allen uh, Frank House only because, first of all, it's in almost the exact condition it was when they built it. Second of all, uh, he t it was when he was teaming up with uh, Marcel Breuer, who uh, we'll talk about in a bit. Just a quick reference to Oscar Niemeyer because he proved that you could have real fun with designing things in modernism and, and expressionism a bit here. You see again what he did in the capital city of Brazil with the National Congress building, with the presidential palace, with the cathedral, and that spectacular ceiling they have inside of it. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then what's Minnesota's contribution to this? This is something you're never going to guess, because this is one of my favorite stories. This building is so important. <laughs> this, and, and Nordic Ware got permission to put their name on it because they repaired it back when it needed it. But it's a national historic landmark. OK, that's above National Register of Historic Places. It was built in 1899. Why is it important? Because of those experimental. This was the first time anyone decided to build a concrete grain elevator. People thought it was going to blow up or light on fire, like because I think they were used to the wood ones lighting on fire, um, let alone making it circular. And they built it, and it worked, and it spread like wildfire, especially along the Great Lakes, because sensibly that's where all the grain was going, around the harbor of Duluth, obviously in Minneapolis, get to Buffalo, New York, there's a ton there. So what happens? Well, there's a guy in Germany who starts collecting. He loves these. He loves these factory buildings that we're making in the US, how functional they are. He loves how we're making these grain elevators. He was like, they're like Egyptian monuments on a scale we've been talking about academically. But they're building them, and they're like you know, 100 feet tall, and they're in, in the clusters of these things. So I heard about this book. So luckily, eight books had a copy. I picked it up, uh, work fun. Walter Gropius, the guy we were just talking about, the guy who came back to the United States, who came, pardon me, came back. He came to the United States and taught at Harvard for many years. He is a person who collected pictures. He gave a, his first public lecture in 1911 with a lot of slides. Some of those slides made it into this book. And so I started looking through it. I don't speak German. Um, but I looked at this picture, and I'm like, I recognize one of these. Wait a second. The Walsh and Crosby, OK. Corn silo, OK. There she is. By the way, that photo was taken in the first year it was built, because the sign went up the next year. Um, but again, Minnesota, Minnesota design, Minnesota ideas, made it all the way to Germany. And the published version of that article was a phenomenon in Europe. Le Corbusier read it and was like, these are, these are, the, these are the future, you know. He, he started to famously edit the photos. He loved to kind of smooth them out and make them look even more modern, uh, because no one really was like, ha, that's shopped. No, no one knew that. So um, again, so and then so you get the spread to the US. And you see, again, mostly thanks to the uh, unfortunate result of World War II, uh, benefit of the US, Gropius went to Harvard, Mies went to an Illinois Institute of Technology. Uh, Mendelssohn went to UC Berkeley. Breuer also went to Harvard. Cert went to Harvard. Alto briefly went to MIT, returned to Finland. Belusky was at MIT. Saarinen was at Cranbrook. And Albers, a Bauhaus artist, went to Yale before they split off the architecture department in 72. Um, so modernism in America. Schindler House, Los Angeles, 1921 to 22. 21 to 22. This house is, when you realize the age of it, it's, it's just bonkers uh, ahead of its time. I, I, I recommend going to this house. It's a museum. I've been to it a couple of times. I've taken my kids. I took pictures of them because they're going to have to appreciate why I took them there. Uh, <laughs> they were not very old. But um, this house, uh, Schindler worked for, wanted to work for uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. So he came here and worked for Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, helped run the office while Frank Lloyd Wright was out in Japan um, working on the projects that he did out there. And while he was here, he decided he really just wanted to have fun experimenting with this. Yosemite, his trip to Yosemite and the cabins up there influenced it. But what makes this house so amazing is the flow from indoors to outdoors. Um, it just completely, it, at one point, it's actually a kind of a, it's a, two, a double house. At one point, he shared it with a, a, a rival, a frenemy, uh, Richard Neutra, who is also uh, ends up being a, probably the better known of the two architects. Um, but again, I recommend visiting this thing, the Tilt Slab Concrete. So speaking of Neutra, 
Uh, this house he designed in Los Angeles in the hills uh, is one of those pivotal moments. Uh, the Lovell House, with its use of glass, with its sweep, with its um, how it sits on the property. I love this photo. I love seeing kids playing in a house because then it makes it more realistic to me. I think anyone with kids, it's like, oh, people could actually live in it. Um, and that wonderful pool, the California lifestyle, being able to live outside. And then meanwhile in Philadelphia, you have what could be considered the first use of the international style. Um, not as refined as the Seagram's. That didn't come out until about 25 years after this building. So as you can see, it doesn't feel as refined or as clean as that structure. But with this one, we start to see it, and it's designed by George Howe and William Lescaz, who is a Swiss architect. He actually designed a house here in Woodland, so really close by. I haven't seen it on a tour yet, but I'd love to one day. The Frederick Nash House. Nash was an artist. He demolished the house on his lot and hired Lascaz to build him a new house because he was an art dealer and he wanted to have a modern house. His, um, his own house went for like $20 million in Manhattan, by the way. So not saying this one would, but you know, it probably would go up in value. Uh, <laughs> that's, not a, that's, not a, that's not investment advice. I'm a lawyer. So, um, so <laughs> You can't not mention the Guggenheim Museum again. Uh, one of the Frank Lloyd Wright's just pivotal works, just radical in design, the Nautilus shell concept. Oops, oh, these went out of order. Okay, so that's again, sorry about that. That's something that was supposed to be falling water. Somehow they, they swapped on me. I'm like, how did we get to the Guggenheim already? So falling water, oh my gosh, we don't have the beautiful photo of falling water. Somehow they swapped when this went into the thing. All right, well, you know it, important building, probably the most important house, and we don't have it uh, in the slideshow, except for the interior. And of course, Johnson Wax, his other work, one of his other important works in Racine, with the incredible open office concept with those, um, with those famous columns holding it up um, in Palm Springs, the Palm Springs style, no Richard Neutra being one of those great um, uh, uh, developers of that. When, you know, late 40s, we see these structures, and let's see what pops up there. There we go. Um, I love that photo from the, the, the 60s. That is just awesome. That is Palm Springs. That is fun. I love when people tell me they're building a Palm Springs style house. I saw one in the Star Trip a few years ago and I looked at this gabled thing and I'm like, that is not Palm Springs. That is not even remotely Palm Springs. Okay, a wall is white. I'll give you that. But, um, but again, I love this interior photo because it might as well be an outdoor photo. Again, the California indoor outdoor lifestyle, which was until we had better building materials, a lot easier to pull off. Uh, on the west coast than it was here. Eames, this is one of the case study houses, but Charles and Ray Eames, a married couple, were brilliant designers. You know their furniture. You may not know who designed it, but you know their furniture. Um, but their house was equally as bold in design. Like, for example, you all know that chair. You've seen it. I wonder how much they paid for theirs. No, uh, but, uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, I mean, oh, man, they have factory uh, discount. No, but the, uh, so again, it's, I love the, the design, and their studio was built on the back of it, as well as a sort of separate structure on the same property. And then Glasshouse, Philip Johnson never hid the fact that he was copying the Farnsworth House. In fact, when he was assembling his designs and assembling some of the things he would do, he, he loved it. He's like, I'm gonna make my own version of it. So it's out there in New Canaan. Um, he's fallen a little bit out of vogue, because after that international style thing, he decided to go to Germany and kind of get a little too close to the Nazi party. So it has to be said, but uh, he would have had a fun time if he tried to stay there because he was openly gay. Um, but, uh, but, there, but his, his structures do deserve note and they do deserve mention that it's the interior of the glass house. And in Orono, he made the reverse of it. Uh, he didn't call it the brick house, but it's still there. It's over on the other side of the lake and uh, it opens into, it's mostly brick on the outside and it's, I couldn't find a good photo of it, but on the left side there is a square uh, atrium in the middle of it that the house opens in onto rather than opening out onto. So kind of a reverse of that, that sort of bathroom slash pipes that you saw in the glass house. Um, the Lieber House in New York City, the, one of the earliest of this kind of, this style that we know, I would, I would also, uh, Natalie Deblois was one of the architects working on it, one of those sort of major architects you don't hear about because again, she, but she was one of the, the designers of this structure. Um, there we go, okay, there it is again. Um, so there we know the inside, and we know the, the, the bottom. All right, let's keep moving here. TWA Fright Center, Eero Saarinen, you start to see expressionism here with a bird taking flight. Classic design, the building has been well restored uh, for the most part, it's now a hotel, I love it. That's what it looked like, that's what it looks like now. It is now a hotel, they built two hotel wings flanking it, and then this is the structure inside. 
I'm wrapping up nationally talking about the Christian Science Center because I want to also talk about the Christian, uh, the First Church of Christ Scientist building here. But they, as a congregation, always open to design. So I am pay. Uh, he didn't design this building, one of his own designers did, uh, but he passed recently, so that's why it's, it's also neat to see that name. But in Boston, this, uh, this construction, this, this complex, was sort of, again, designed for uh, the Christian Science Center. So modernism in Minnesota, their key voices, I'm not going to go through everyone, don't worry, but uh, we're talking about, but if I could single out six people, I would, Ralph Rapson, you just can't get, you can't say enough about how his designs and, and his approach to teaching and, and influencing so many architects in the state. Um, Robert Cerny, lots of buildings, important buildings in the state were from him. He was also a professor at the U. Liza Close, Elizabeth Close, Elizabeth Shaw, the house we saw with Albert Lewis where I said it's going to come back later, the one that's going to be stepped. That was her childhood home. She ended up settling here. Um, Edward Sovic, I mean, he, I wish more people knew about him because his approach to church design changed the game. And he was very academic. He lived in Northfield, uh, practiced in Northfield, but designed probably 400 churches around the country. Um, and his designs of the idea of bringing a church to the people, we'll get to that in a second. James Stagerberg, very talented, lots of great structures, uh, especially houses. And John Howe, who was the right hand of Frank Lloyd Wright. He was his draftsman, but absolutely knew how to make a structure that is beautiful. Um, there's one not far from here in Minatrista that we're going to mention in a brief bit. And a lot of other firms. I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, this is what happens when you go through that many firms at once. Um, so some notable structures just to mention. What will it be? <laughs> so we have University Grove. If you ever can see one area of the Twin Cities, if you want to see mid-century modernism on parade, go to University Grove. It's in Falcon Heights. It's, it's a university neighborhood built by the university and sold to people who work for or are faculty members. Within a budget, they could build something. Many of them chose architects with a modern style. So you see just a beautiful cluster of it. Malcolm Willie House in Minneapolis, extremely important to Frank Lloyd Wright's career. He had a dry spell there, um, combination of the Great Depression and some of his own personal foibles. He was not really getting a lot of active commissions. So this house was the first, one of the first that he got when he started being able to practice again. And in this house, he displayed, some have mis Miss said it's the first ranch house. That's, that's not true at all. The ranch house developed in Southern California from the Hacienda Spanish style house. But it is in many ways a ranch house. It just incredible in how it brings the indoors to the outdoors um, in its own ways. Like this is the, one of the best examples of how indoor outdoor living can be. Look at that and the, the decision to use the same material uh, for the, the, the brick in both ways. Many of his stylistic choices, of course the fireplace, he, he's always great designing those. Um, and then right across the street, Liza Close. Uh, well, this is when she didn't change her name professionally. So it was Winston Close, her husband, and Liza Show, the uh, Ray Faulkner house. And it faces the Malcolm Willie house. So it's, it's kind of these two are really important houses next to each other. The first real use of the international style in the Twin Cities. It was originally a smaller house, squarish, and then they added an extension you can see on the back when uh, another, a new owner uh, came in, but it was designed by the closest, so you get, again, some harmonious design and on the interior as well. There's some great books about her and, um, and uh, uh, John Howell that have been written. I recommend them both. Um, uh, Christ Church Lutheran, extremely important church, national landmark. Ilyil Saarinen, again, a not very well off, uh, but you know, a modest in means Lutheran church wrote to him and asked him to design him a church that would be beautiful, but within their means. And we have this a great example. It won the National 25 Year Award in 1977 um, by the American Institute of Architects for its importance. Um, the interior, it uses simple, it, it, it's simple, the, the, the flow, the curves in the upper wall, you know, it, it, the, the importance of this structure can't be overstated. You can find much material on it. There's some excellent writing on it, and I recommend visiting it. it there's something beautiful in its simplicity and its spirituality. And his son, Eero Saarinen, who designed that TWA thing we just saw, built the educational wing that goes next to it in a way that respects his father's work. In fact, it's a, got a two-story auditorium. He built it, uh, or gymnasium, they built it down so it won't detract from the, uh, the church next door. So let's talk about a few others. So St. Columba Catholic Church in St. Paul, Barry Byrne, national architect. Um, 
You see bits of the modern coming in here, but again, it is beautiful mid-century. Church recommend seeing it. Mount Zion Lutheran Church just changed hands last year as I was researching this. It's now called Reformed Anglican. Um, but it is by the same architect uh, who designed the uh, first Church of Christ Scientist here in um, Excelsior. And uh, this church is a great example of, again, a mid-century style church. It uses Roman brick. They were built within a year of each other. Um, this church and the one over there. Uh, it's got that interesting metalwork, the interesting design. Um, I do love that sculpture in front of the door. Come on now. There we go. All right, and you can't not mention St. John's Abbey. Marcel Breuer, we were talking about him and how he used to work with Walter Gropius. This is a colossal church, and I know it's a love or hate design, but if you have never been inside of it, you have to go inside of it because you have to come back and you have to see, well, it won a national you know, AIA award when it came out. Um, it took many years to construct, unsurprisingly. Again, there's a wonderful book, uh, I forgot the name of it, about the construction of the church. Um, and I forgot the, uh, but the interior, it's, it's dramatic, but when you turn around and you look at that honeycomb stained glass window, it is just, it is awe-inspiring. Um, again, I recommend, and there's many other Breuer buildings on that particular campus. So Mendel, uh, Mendelssohn, we were just talking about him back when we looked at that Einstein Tower. I said, remember him. So he designed Mount Zion Temple in St. Paul. It's off of, I think it's Summit Avenue or the Grand, I can't remember. Summit, Summit, yeah, I always get those two mixed up. Uh, he, he actually um, died during construction, so uh, uh, this is one of his last works, but it is in a beautiful building. Um, you see a bit of that kind of expressionism, I think, with that curve, especially on that, on that side at the bottom. But uh, very nice, very simple, uh, but at the same time has reverence you'd hope for a religious structure. Um, <laughs> we live in the state where you've got to mention a shopping mall. Um, <laughs> But Victor Groen and Associates, the Southdale Shopping Mall, again, you can't talk, it, it, pivotal, it was pivotal to the development of malls across the country, if not the world. Um, I love finding this full page ad in the Star, or the, I think it was Minneapolis Star the day before it opened, um, with its radical design. Because he, Victor Groen thought this was going to be a town square. He thought this was going to be a replacement. He thought people were going to go in the middle and discuss new ideas, you know, not hot dog on a stick. So, um, but... Uh, it's important, and, 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 and it's fascinating, too. I mean, he designed the Dayton department store of this particular structure. Um, and what makes it important was the first enclosed climate-controlled um, shopping mall. Um, and you can still see bits of the original today if you know where to look. They changed it. It's got a new name on it. It wasn't like they were shuttering it. They just were changing the sign. It's got a new name on it now. And then the more important thing was he was a city planner. So he really designed the whole area around the shopping mall. I turned it to be north with a shopping mall. He knew there was gonna be a hospital over here. He knew there was gonna be housing over here, office buildings. It was kind of, it didn't get entirely realized, but the whole idea was he wanted the, the building to flow to itself with all of the, the pathways and all of the, the ways to get to it. General Mills headquarters, Skinny, more Owings and Merrill. Look at that little thing, isn't it cute? But it was a big deal at the time, I'm gonna tell you. They, they, I read national articles about how they had to basically bring all of the things that an office building would need out to the middle of Golden Valley because there was nothing out there. Um, and the building is pretty intact for the most part, uh, which is striking. I mean, here you can now see the freeway built there. And then there it is today. All they did was they, they covered up that empty space that they left with an atrium. So, I mean, it, it, they enclosed it. That's, that's about all that's been done to that building. It's kind of neat. Um, and then Eero Saarinen, again, the son of Eliel Saarinen, designed the uh, IBM Center in Rochester, an expandable building. I read a series of angry letters in progressive architecture about when they published this and they said the curtain wall is, you know, five sixteenths of an inch thick, some people were like, you are a liar. There's no way you can build this in Minnesota and it will not freeze everyone to death inside. Um, and there were a series of letters, but it worked as it turned out. And it was a very, very popular building, because again, the idea is you could add to it, it was functional, and it was pretty because of the, the, the technology that was used to, to make those, that curtain wall. And then again, Ralph Rapson, I'm sure some of you have seen this in Edina, it's just on France, St. Peter's Lutheran Church. Um, unfortunately, some of the windows on the street level have been enclosed under some misunderstood uh, updating decisions, but the interior is just, it's wonderful. Again, the idea of doing that. And MSP, surprisingly, Dorshov and Cerny, this is really Cerny's work on this. Um, 
from the beginning when they didn't quite figure out what the roof was going to be, as you can see here, the design won an award. And yeah, the, the optional floating hotel on top of it was something they had flirted with. <laughs> But they didn't do it. Um, and then the roof came, became the roof that we know now with this kind of, the, with, the, with the, the edges sort of flattened out. But it made a lot of national news when it came out. That was, that's, because it was functional inside. All the walls, it was the open plan. You could, so when I look inside at first, I'm like, yeah, but the interior of this probably looks nothing like it was when it opened. That was the point. The point was you didn't have to alter the whole structure. The interior could be redone however they needed it to. So the way it is now at least, is serving the purpose it meant, which is why, as an international airport, it is still being used um, under the main original structure. The first National Bank building, I think it's now the Canadian Railway Building, um, first modern skyscraper in, say, in Minneapolis, and therefore the world, no, uh, <laughs> but in, uh, in, uh, in Minneapolis. Again, this one, I love it too, because it got in so many ads for like five years. Again, if you're looking for sections for, uh, Electrical, uh, electrical stuff, and you know a lot of steel work too. Um, again, I love the the use of metals. It had aluminum and steel ads for it. Benjamin Gingol House in Minneapolis. This is it South Minneapolis, not far from the lakes? This house is just so beautiful. And the crazy thing is, if you look it up today, because it went on the market a few years ago, the interior hasn't been changed at all. And it's a house that got national attention, not because people thought this is the best house ever made, but they're like, this architect went wild. And they were just like, game appreciates game. So I use this church, Westwood Lutheran in St. Louis Park, because it is probably one of the better local examples of Ed Sovic's church design. He tends to design churches that are very functional because he, he wrote a book called Architecture of Worship. Short piece, beautiful piece, because he said, the way the Bible talked about the way churches are, a church is the people. When the people get together, that is the church. The idea of making it a structure was after you know, the, the, the death of Jesus, after the Bible was written, when they're looking around Rome, they're like, what do we do with all these temples now? Well, let's convert them into churches. So those became the church. And then he said that's become a problem. So his idea of designing a structure was the inside. It should be something that can be used for anything. He thought you should be able to, first of all, you should have chairs, not pews. The altar should be a series of pl platforms that can be moved. You could have a civic function in here. You could have the public in there. It does not have to be religious structure. So his buildings especially tend to be built around that. Um, and this is probably one of the better examples in the Twin Cities. There are some around the state, and he designed a lot of churches. Yamazaki designed the Northwestern National Life Building in Minneapolis. Um, well, I remember when I moved here, I did think it was an opera house. Um, but uh, it is, uh, was designed for a life insurance company. Yamazaki, of course, designed probably the most famous structure were the, the New York World Trade Centers, the ones that were knocked down. Um, and he designed a lot of buildings in Carlton, which is actually kind of stunning if you get to go down there. So I, I, you don't have to worry about these exact uh, clippings. But 1963, the design was published. Oh, wow, look at that. The next year, these guys in Orange County said, we're going to build a building that's going to look really cool. And I love that the National Magazine went like, this isn't Yamazaki's building. This is another building that's being built in Orange County. Um, in the 70s, they tightened up the copyright laws for this. But in those days, they didn't exist. So you could just, there it is, the snub nose version of the, uh, of the building in Minneapolis. It's now called the Taj Mahal Medical Center. That wasn't its original name. But I love it. So here, here's what our building looks like in context. You could see it in downtown Minneapolis. It kind of fits, especially with the Gateway Center that was being built around this side. And then there's the one in Orange County. They just sort of plopped it in a parking lot. <laughs> Might as well just be a mall. So anyway, I just, that, that, that one fascinates me. Um, meanwhile, up in Duluth, we have this by Pietro Beluski, uh, who was the dean of MIT for many years. Um, he, he had the perfect life. He, after he was a dean of MIT, he'd work with any local firm. He would do the design. They'd have to work out how to make it work. Um, and this is one of those buildings. He actually designed two of the Twin Cities. The former um, XL headquarters in downtown Minneapolis is also one of his. Uh, a little bit more Italian-esque if you look at sort of its elements. But this one in Duluth is spectacular. I wrote it up once um, for the AA Online magazine for Minnesota. Um, I recommend a visit. Let's see what pops up next. Oh, Dragon Peak in Orono. This is just across the lakes. This is expressionism in a delightful way. And it was built for a gentleman who basically had to sell it within a few years. So the original owner wasn't in there long. But the idea is, and, and if you know his work, he's best known for some of the most intense, brutalist structures at the University of Chicago. Here, totally different direction. 
a Palladian footprint if you really want to look at it. It looks like a very, it really throws back to old architecture. And then the inside, just wow color. Uh, I couldn't find too many photos of the interior, but it was featured in, um, in the uh, coffee table book of his work. And again, Dragon Peak. It's still there, it's still in Orono. They, it was a huge lot, they subdivided the lot quite a bit. But the house is still there and it looks to be in good condition. I haven't gone and knocked on the door because I'm afraid a dragon will get me. Um, IDS Center, extremely important structure for both the city of Minneapolis and the, tw and the downtown area, but also for Philip Johnson because he was becoming a little bit, people were saying he was kind of past his prime. He was cool, he had some neat designs, he did the glass house, he did some other stuff. But what's he going to do for a second come? What's he going to do for his next step? IDS Center is where he basically hooked his, he hooked his coat on making this one big. Um, and it worked. It was obviously, it dominated the skyline if you've seen pictures back in the day. But I mean, I, I, it's the only building in Minnesota that made a cover of a national magazine, in this case the AIA National Journal, twice, both for the Crystal Court and just the structure itself with the original way the, uh, the uh, um, concert hall used to look. Walker Arts Center in Minneapolis, Edward Larrabee Barnes, another international, national architect designing a nationally awarded structure for its bare minimalism. I don't know why these period photos were so poor, but I guess no one knew where to aim a camera. Um, uh, trust me, I had to crop that one. Gunnar Burkett uh, designed the Federal Reserve Bank. Yeah, th this was originally built as a Federal Reserve Bank. The idea of a the first suspension building with this Rad I mean, the cable structure, which was still left visible with the way they did the, uh, the, the, um, with the, the window and uh, completely open on the underside. It has been filled in, and there's unfortunately a building behind it that has kind of ruined it a little bit, but it's still, you can see it. Kenzo Tange, one of Japan's most important architects, his first U.S. commission was the expansion of the Minneapolis Institute of Art, as well as the children's theater that you see on the side of it, as well as building... Um, the MCAD main building. Um, and then right over there in Minnetrista, the Goodale House. This is John Howe's, one of his best works. I think it's the most published one, with the way of the glass coming together like a ship's prow. Um, again, clearly, as you can see, his influence of working so many years as the right hand of Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, Cedar Square West, AKA Cedar Riverside. Boo. No, I mean, I, I, this is a building where you either like it or hate it. But this is, again, you can see a little bit of La Corbusier coming in with this influence. This structure, the more I read about it, the more I fell in love with it. Because what it was trying to do, the complex that didn't get built, was uh, unfortunate. Um, it was heavily featured in so many publications when it first opened, when they realized the rest of it wasn't going to be built. The ultimate failure for this structure, I think, was oddly enough nimbyism from uh, basically s hippies, settled hippies next to it that just didn't want big structures next to them. Um, that was, and I'm not saying that to be facetious, that's literally what it boiled down to. Um, now it's called the American Indian Center, but the Native American Center at the time by Hodney Stagerberg, they really went out of their way and, and, and learned about the cultures that they were representing. They made sure to hire an architect who was of Native American extraction when they, when they took the commission. Um, and it's a beautiful building. I recommend going and walking around and seeing it's over on Franklin. Um, you know, you wouldn't be an architect with a house made of without a house made of glass. So here we have Ralph Rapson's own glass cube just across the border in Wisconsin. Um, it's a nifty house. It was featured really well because apparently used 48 Anderson windows and eight Anderson gliding doors. Um, <laughs> you know, this is another like it or hate it building. I, when I moved here and I went to the U, that was where the bookstore was. This building, I did not appreciate how radical it was because again it was an energy crisis how do you deal with it let's build things into the ground well how do we make it not dark well let's angle the building so the house this didn't quite work the way they had wanted it to with the original drawings and and some of the concepts like the plants would grow out and be shade in the summer that was never really worked in my opinion <laughs> that, that was a very popular idea for like 30 years um, but overall, it, its influence was tremendous. There's so many published articles on it in national things because it was done at a level that no one else had done. Um, and the structure's importance, I think, is, uh, is underappreciated, probably because 1975 to 1976. But hey, give it a few years, it'll be 50. Um, the, uh, and then I'm going to, as we wrap up the, the, the big national buildings in the state of Minnesota, Colonial Church of Edina is actually early postmodernism, and it won a national award for being so, again, ahead of its time, creating that New England village feel. 
Um, for a while there it had a shingle siding, and I thought that was the original. Then I saw the original picture in this award citation, and they had gone back to the original siding. So I actually didn't have shingle siding at first. A Lejeune residence in Orono, I'm only mentioning it because it's the only house in the state of Minnesota that won a national award. Um, it's in Partonwood, which is primarily buildings designed by uh, John Howell. But this, this, this guy's back there, and uh, it's still there. And uh, it, the way it fit the site, a tight site, and made itself kind of uh, expressive there. So South Lake Minnetonka, which is where we are. Obviously, we're talking about the Tonka Theater. We've already talked about it. Um, and I love this site, this, this street view, because you have the old National Tea. Uh, the company's called National Tea. I'm so used to looking up their permits and seeing National Tea, and it's just national food stores. Um, you have Laramie Ford. You have the Tonka Building. And then, uh, which is now, uh, um, pardon me, the, the Doc Cinema. You know, and then this is a great example of the housing boom. So this is Edgewater Manor. It's still there. I think they've changed the name quite a few times. But it's just at the end of the street. It's on the peninsula. I think it's Galpin Lake, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly. This was an interesting example of Erwin Engler. I wouldn't say he's ever designed a building of note, to be entirely honest with you. But he designed a ton of these apartment buildings in Minneapolis. So this was an example of a... Uh, Maurice Mandel, the developer, developed tons of apartments and decided to try something, his hand at that out here. So that's an example of a Minneapolis style uh, or big city style sort of housing apartment structure complex out here. Um, Acorn Ridge, it's in Minnetonka, but you know, that was back when it was Minnetonka Township, so basically Deep Haven. It's just across the border, like literally just across the border. It's important because, again, Page and Hill was a company that built Houses. They built houses, they'd send you a kit, or then they'd, they'd assemble it, whatever. So this whole neighborhood, and it's still there, was designed by Liza Close, who we were talking about, because they saw her MIT thesis, where she was talking about the need for housing and the need to create housing. So this structure, uh, this, is, this is a good example. I've driven around that neighborhood, and it's really hard to spot a house that looks as close to the original as this, obviously, this, this original photo would be. But it's, it's, important. it's one of the more important neighborhoods of this sort in the state, and it's really, it's very close by. Um, and then, you know, you see, again, as an example, we're talking about South Minneapolis, pardon me, the South Lake Minnetonka area, we see the classic things we see everywhere. We see this, this St. John the Baptist Church by Shiflet, Baxter, and Carter. The school, it's, it's classic. It's a school. They, they built it before they built the church. So, of course, the auditorium, as you can see, was clearly designed to double as a church. And then a few years later, when budgets came around, they were able to design the church that goes next to it. You see this throughout the state. This is a classic mid-century thing. Grace Lutheran Church in Deep Haven. You have the 1951 colonial style church. Then you have the extension that's built by McNary and Kraft in 1954. And then when they finally built the planned large church, I don't think McNary and Kraft was even around in 1966, but they went with the same firm that designed, actually, this is the same firm that designed the uh, first uh, uh, Church of Christ Scientist here Armstrong, Schickling, Torseth, and Skull. The firm is still around. We'll get to that in a second. Um, so again, that you see. You see the way modernism will creep in as they, they look for budgets. I love the Excelsior Methodist Church. This, uh, the drawings are fascinating. This is a 1952 sketch, so early. Then it sort of evolves into this 1955 sketch, which is closer to what you get. And it's clearly been designed to be seen from Highway 7. This is, this is designing for the automotive age. Um, and that was a, a one last sketch right before the building, right when about the time it was finished. Obviously, a lot of buildings in that era were designed in wings, so the first structure was built. You have the church, and you have probably a basement that's used for some um, educational purposes, but it was built as planned. It's sitting there. You can't miss it as you're driving down Highway 7, and it just absolutely, it, that, that horizontal form is just lovely. And again, it's got all the additions. Um, anyways, I appreciate that church a lot. One of the, again, we've mentioned Robert Cerny. He designed so many buildings in the state, uh, MSB Airport, uh, many structures, but he lived here. He settled here. He had two houses here. The first one demolished, I think, right after he, he moved into his new one. But his second house is still there in Deep Haven. Um, that's why there's a Roman numeral two, the Robert Cerny House two, the Revenge, um, in 1957. I, I couldn't get a picture of the interior of it, not that I was trying to like hunt in it. But the idea is he built it around this glass section in the middle. So again, it's sort of like what we were talking about with that uh, Philip Johnson house in Orono, where it's, it's mostly brick on the outside, at least on the street side. I'm sure it's got plenty of glass facing the lake, but on the inside. So that's, again, an architect's house, one of the most important architects in the Twin Cities, and it's still there. I'm actually surprised it hasn't been demolished. Um, Ray Methune residence in Deep Haven went on the market not that long ago, but uh, the reason I mentioned it, it was Newton Griffith, who was 
Uh, an architect in the Twin Cities, his houses were spectacular, and then he just died abruptly, like of a heart attack in his 40s. So, I mean, just one of those guys were like, this is, we're all going to hear about him, and then unfortunately he passed. But he designed, um, obviously, Campbell Mithun, um, or Mithun Campbell, I always forget how it's, uh, but you know the agency. But he wanted a California style house, and he got one um, with that lovely open back um, looking on Lake Minnetonka. Now, there's sometimes clusters of houses that are mid century. I, I noticed that there's two in Shorewood Timber Lane, this sort of group of mid century. There was one more, but that house is now there. Oops. Um, but it's sort of fascinating to see these. I'm just going to breeze through them. Um, but when you see sort of a cluster of mid centuries all facing a lake, or Ridge, Ridge Road in Shorewood, that's a spectacular road to drive when it's icy, I'll tell you that. If you've ever been out there, some of you know what I'm talking about. Um, but again, a, a lovely cluster of, of, of modern homes overlooking lakes on both sides on an isthmus. Um, let's see. You know, I, Thorshav, and here I'm telling you Cerny is a great architect and we're looking at the Excelsior Fire Department. Um, very functional building. I don't think anyone anticipated, I guess, your city hall moved there for uh, many years afterwards when they demolished the, the village hall that was uh, where this is. Um, but there, you know, 78, that's what it looked like then. Um, you know, I, I have a big thing about post offices. I'm not going to bore you with it. But I find the Excelsior Post Office fascinating because they, they're rarely designed by architects. But the government had, the Postmaster General loved international style architecture. So he created a whole, like, guide to, you could pick three styles. International style was the cheapest. So a lot of people picked that one. And local builders could make their own twist on it. And you'd see that. The one thing that's fascinating about the one here is I haven't seen one with a tuck under like this, let alone one that's being rented out. I don't know if it was originally rented out, um, but uh, I, I love it. Because the idea was the builder would own it. They, they said, the post office said, you will have a forever tenant. We will be the tenant in your building. You pay for it. And it's a double win. They could, the builder would foot the bill for building the structure because after the after post war when the suburbs blew up the post office couldn't possibly afford to build all the post offices that were suddenly necessary for the housing boom so that was their way of doing it people will build us these buildings house and how it managed to go horizontally to spread that out rather than make this giant bulky monster um, Wire Stramp House in Deep Haven was one of Ralph Rapson's designs um, again uh, you see his interiors they tend to be very open you know, with a minimal amount of load-bearing walls. Um, good views of the lake, but kind of turns its back on the street for privacy purposes. Um, oh, the Harvey Mackey House in Shorewood. That's a James Stagerberg structure. And then the Gloria II House. This is literally right across the street from the uh, Deep Haven. This Ralph Rapson House is one of his later works in 1977. It was remodeled recently by Charles Stinson. In 2019, um, Stinson had studied, like many architects in the local area, under wraps and really wanted to do it. It, it was quite reserved. It's really nice. It was a, it was a wonderful tour. Um, contemporary designs today, you see this Deep Haven house by Julie Snow that Dean Phillips recently sold. Um, I can say whose house it was. Um, very tasteful, wonderful house. Um, this house by Salmala, who's a great architect up in Duluth. His designs are lovely, especially this sucker he did. Um, <laughs> in Deep Haven, the street of residence. It's really, it's really nice with the two volumes for father and son on the top. Um, then you have, a, this, arc, this firm is literally around the corner, uh, Altus Architecture. This house in Woodland is really neat, just very glassy. Um, you, some of you may have seen this on Manitoba Boulevard, the Deep Haven house that they designed uh, recently and that really nice back they have on it. Um, and then, hey, in Leonard Park and uh, a little further north, um, Again, nice, open, glassy, fun, great for kids, trust me. Uh, and then, uh, <laughs> so, the, uh, huh? Who lives there? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> so, I, again, I apologize. The one thing that didn't load was the title card for this section. So now let's t t wrap up by talking about the uh, um, First Church of Christ scientist here in um, an Excelsior, this, how, this structure actually caught my eye the first time I drove by it. And I, I told people about it, I'm like, there's a church in Excelsior and it doesn't quite look like a church, but there's a lot of clear thought that went into it. It wasn't just some random you know, structure slapped together. Um, I should say, this is before the, the extension. I made sure to put the date because you're going to see that this window, this grid of windows doesn't exist because the building was expanded later. Um, but uh, a lot of what made it kind of, um, oops, sorry kind of interesting, it's clad in that 
that buff color uh, rum and brick we saw in that Mount Zion church we saw a little bit earlier. And um, it's got the wide flat eaves with stucco soffits and aluminum fascia. There's a color photo from the, that era. Um, the wood was originally, you know, it was almost like a teal. Um, and and that's, that's since been changed. But that central kind of um, one and a half story worship space in the middle, the auditorium, it has a shed roof, but, uh, and a ribbon of sort of clear story windows up here to let in light, let in lots of natural light, south facing, so you get quite a bit of light coming into there. Um, and it's flanked by those one story flat roofed sections. This is a color photo, so that was the original paint job. I mean, it's, it was remodeled later, and we'll see the remodel, but that was originally how that color was. And then in 1964, we don't know who the architect was, but I would be surprised if it wasn't either planned at, at their origin or if it wasn't by Armstrong and Schickling, but they added the, uh, the, the, the expansion on the edge, which frankly, I, when I saw the picture, I realized they had done an expansion because I was like, where did this window, where's this window? Um, but uh, yeah, here you see some photos from 64 as they were building it. And then in 73, the structure, this is right before they did an interior renovation, because then in 75, you get these photos of how they remodeled the interior. Again, more uh, contemporary for that particular amount of time. And the design, it's so subdued, but it works. It's, it's a place of peace. It's, it, you look in there and you say, this is a place where you can have peaceful contemplation about whatever. It doesn't have to be about, about spirituality, about, about anything. Um, that was the first time I saw it in 2019. I stopped and took a photo. And here you can see how the extension, it's, it, you just you have to know it was added um, to, to see it for the most part. And it was done so skillfully. Um, the building is, is low. And, and I think to its credit, um, that gives it, uh, it lets it blend in with the neighborhood. It doesn't dominate it. It's in a residential neighborhood. Originally, that parking lot wasn't nearly as big. Now, it replaced a, a previous church that was a house on the site. Um, and then they eventually bought the lot behind them and cleared that out for more parking space. So it was even closer to the neighboring structures. But um, this house, again, it's a great example of the mid-century style. And um, it, uh, it, it, it complements the area. And... I know I read the Heritage Preservation Commission report that was written up for this last summer. And I, and I know they gave it to a very talented um, uh, Amy Lucas at Landscape Research LLC. I agreed with what you said. I just want to quote some of the quotes I pulled out of there. The subdued arrangement of brick boxes with geometric windows and band of clear story lighting in the worship space reflects the principles of mid-century modern style, which emphasize simplicity, functionality, and rationality. Though vacant, the building continues to reflect the feeling of the church with the historic design, materials, space, and signage. Um, but what also is amazing about this building is how easy it could be used for something else. When I, again, when I started seeing interior photos, I'm like, this could be used as a library. If you told me this was a library, if you told me this was a government structure, if you told me this was even a cafe, I wouldn't be shocked. Um, so again, what, that's what I think makes this building such a great example of mid-century style is its functionality. It could be anything. Um, it reminded me a bit of what Sovik was talking about, although this was before many of his documents were published. Um, so Armstrong and Schickling, again, they're, they're still around, by the way. They, they were founded in 1944. Um, they're still in Golden Valley as ATSNR, um, which was basically just the acronym of the final lineup. Um, Schickling retired, so they took his name out of it. So it became Armstrong, Torseth, Skold, and Rydine. And then they just went ahead and, and shortened it to ATSNR. Um, and that is it. Thank you for your patience. So if you need to reach me, you can email me. I'm on the U directory. I'm probably the only guy that has a name remotely spelled like mine. So you'll come and go, hey, thank you, Fido. Um, so thank you. I appreciate it.